I'm Ryan Stitt, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 109, Socrates. Socrates is widely considered to be the father of Western philosophy because his students would go on to found many different philosophical schools of thought, and thus his influence would be felt for generations. Unfortunately, though, he left behind no writings of his own, as he was vehemently opposed to writing down any of his teachings. Therefore, he owes his renown to the impression that he made on those around him. Above all were his students, who recorded almost everything that we know about his life and what he thought or supposedly thought. The two primary sources for Socrates, then, are Plato and Xenophon, but he had many other students, such as Antisthenes, Ascanius of Sphetis, Euclides of Megara, Phaedo of Elia, and Simon the Shoemaker, though very little of their writings remain. Collectively, these writings are known as the Socraticoi Logoi, or Socratic Dialogues, and consist of reports of conversations or thought exercises that involve Socrates and some other people or persons. The so-called Socratic question lies behind exactly how accurate or fictitious these accounts are to the historical Socrates. Many scholars believe that at least in some works, Plato put his ideas into the mouth of Socrates, and in doing so, exaggerates him quite a bit for specific purposes. In fact, According to Diogenes Laertes, many of Plato's contemporaries, who were also students of Socrates, accused him of re-imaging Socrates in his own image in order to further his own interpretation of his master's message. Notable among his critics are Phaedo, whose writings are now lost, and Xenophon, whose writings present a different view of Socrates than that seen in Plato. And so, while scholars have traditionally relied upon Plato's dialogues as a source of information on historical Socrates, the image of his teacher that has come down to the present day from antiquity could largely be a philosophical construct. At the very least, it is uncertain which Socrates, the historical figure or Plato's fictionalization, is whom he describes at any given point. The problem with discerning Socrates' philosophical views, then, is that it is hard to differentiate between exactly what he thought and what was held by Plato. In fact, Plato's own student Aristotle wasn't even sure what were his master's beliefs and what were those of Socrates. He observed that the only two things he could be certain of attributing to Socrates were inductive reasoning and a universal definition in his examination of key moral concepts, such as good and justice. The matter is complicated further because the historical Socrates seems to have been notorious for asking questions, but not answering, and for claiming to lack wisdom concerning the subjects about which he questioned others. Because of such ambiguity, we will wait to discuss the philosophical aspects of most of the Socratic dialogues when we cover Plato in the future. So for now, we will focus more on what we can ascertain about the historical Socrates, with a little bit of philosophy mixed in. There are four works of Xenophon that deal with Socrates and are considered Socratic dialogues. They are the Oconomicus, or Economics, in which Socrates explains how to ideally manage one's household, the Symposium, which recounts an evening at a lighthearted dinner party where Socrates and other attendants discuss what attribute they take pride in, the Apum Nemum Numata, or the Memorabilia, which is a collection of dialogues that present Socrates' moral principles, and the Apologia Socratus Pro Stichastus, or the Apology of Socrates to the Jurors, which reports a legal defense given by Socrates at his trial. We already discussed the Symposium back in episode 48 and the Oikonomicus in episode 74. Although Xenophon claims to have been present at the Symposium, this is impossible as he was only a young boy at the date which he proposes it occurred. And so he puts into Socrates' mouth what he would have thought him to have said. Furthermore, Xenophon was not even present at the trial of Socrates as he was off campaigning in the Persian Empire in the famous March of the 10,000. More on that next episode. Therefore, it seems that Xenophon later wrote his Apology and Memorabilia as a general defense of Socrates, the person, to the public at large. On the other hand, Plato was present for his trial, but as we mentioned, he also comes with all sorts of issues. Still, we cannot completely dismiss his 29 dialogues that deal with Socrates, and thus are considered Socratic dialogues. We won't list them all out here, as we did with Xenophon. But for those interested, 
We already discussed the symposium in episode 48, and the Parmenides, the Gorgias, the Hippias Major, the Hippias Minor, and the Protagoras in episode 87. And so, in today's episode, we will discuss the last days of Socrates, as chronicled in four of Plato's dialogues. They are the Euthythro, which occurs weeks before his trial, the Apology, which presents Socrates' legal defense speech at his trial, the Crito, which occurs while he is imprisoned after his trial, and the Phaedo, which covers the last hours prior to his death. The other 19 will be discussed in the future. Besides the Socratic dialogues of Xenophon and Plato, the one major contemporary account of Socrates is a caricature of him found in the plays of the comic poet Aristophanes, particularly in the clouds. But even then, these are dramatic texts and not straightforward histories. Still, the testimony of Aristophanes is useful in fleshing out Socrates beyond the idealization of his students. Therefore, collectively, historians must piece together the evidence from the various extant texts and try to separate the real from the false and the philosophy of Socrates from that of his students in order to reconstruct a probable representation of Socrates' life and work. Socrates was born around 470 BC in the city of Athens. His father was Sophroniscus, and his mother was named Phanarete. Little is known of these two, but according to tradition, Sophroniscus was a stonemason or a sculptor, and Phanarete worked as a midwife. In his youth, Socrates likely studied music, gymnastics, and grammar, which were the common subjects of study for a young Greek boy, as we discussed in episode 77. Afterwards, he likely began his career as a stonemason or sculptor, just like his father. According to Pausanias, he was an exceptional artist, and his statue of the Three Graces stood on the road to the Acropolis. However, some scholars question the authenticity of that tradition, because the earliest tradition of Sophroniscus or Socrates as a stonemason or sculptor comes from the 3rd century BC philosopher, Timon of Phlius, as quoted by Diogenes Laertes. But Timon himself is an unreliable authority, as his famous composition was a siloi, a satirical account of famous philosophers, and Xenophon or Plato did not once mention Socrates' background in stone craftsmanship, which one would think that they would have if it were the case, since both writers, as we will see, often make Socrates mention craftsmen in their dialogues. Furthermore, according to Plato in his dialogue Laches, Sophroniscus was a close friend of Lysimachus, who was the son of the illustrious Aristides the Just, which is presumably what allowed Socrates to become familiar with members of the Circle of Pericles, including the younger Alcibiades. This suggests that Socrates' inherent social status was, in fact, much higher than is traditionally recognized. Therefore, he likely was not a stonemason or craftsman, but a wealthy Athenian socialite, Whatever the case, he would give up the family business to study philosophy. Although we don't know who exactly taught Socrates, it was likely not just one person. In fact, in several of the Socratic dialogues, he mentions various people who were major influences on him, including Prodicus, Anaxagoras, and two women, Diatima and Aspasia. Socrates himself explicitly states numerous times, though, that he knows nothing and has no beliefs, but is just repeating the ideas of others. Regardless, and however hard it may be to discern his teachings and philosophical beliefs apart from those of Plato and Xenophon, it seems clear, at least, that Socrates was morally, intellectually, and politically at odds with many of his fellow Athenians of the late 5th century BC. His main focus was on how to live a good and virtuous life, and he believed the best way for people to live was to focus on the pursuit of virtue, rather than the pursuit of material wealth. He always invited others to try to concentrate more on friendships and a sense of true community, as he felt this was the best way for people to grow together as a populace. The idea that there are certain virtues formed a common thread in Socrates' teachings. These virtues represented the most important qualities for a person to have, foremost of which were the philosophical or intellectual virtues. His passionate concern to discover the valid guidelines for leading a just life and to prove that justice is better than injustice under all circumstances gave a new direction to Greek philosophy by placing an emphasis on ethics. Although other thinkers before him, especially the poets and dramatists, 
had dealt with moral issues. Socrates was the first philosopher to make ethics and morality his central concern. Socrates passionately believed that just behavior was better for humans than injustice, and that morality was justified because it created happiness and well-being. Essentially, he seems to have argued that just behavior, or virtue, was identical to knowledge, and that true knowledge of justice would inevitably lead people to choose good over evil, and therefore to have truly happy lives, regardless of their material success. Since Socrates believed that knowledge itself was sufficient for happiness, he asserted that no one knowingly behaved unjustly, and that behaving justly was always in the individual's interest. Although it might appear that individuals could promote their interests by cheating or using force on those weaker than themselves, this appearance was deceptive. It was, in fact, ignorance to believe that the best life was the lie of unlimited power to pursue whatever one desired which contrasted greatly with the traditional notion in Greece at the time of might makes right. Instead, for the most desirable human life, one should be concerned with virtue and guided by rational reflection. Moral knowledge is all one needs for the good life. Therefore, the claim attributed to him by Plato in his Apology, that an unexamined life is not worth living, and ethical virtue is the only thing that matters, seems likely to be historically accurate in that it is clear that he inspired his followers to think for themselves, instead of following the dictates of society on how one should behave and think. Therefore, he became a social critic, rather than upholding the status quo and accepting the development of what he perceived as immorality. In this role, Plato refers to Socrates as the gadfly of the state, because as the gadfly stings the horse into action, so too did Socrates sting various Athenians by irritating them with his unique considerations of justice and the pursuit of goodness. His actions would have a radical effect on Athenian society. According to Socrates and Plato's Apology, his life as the gadfly of Athens began when his longtime friend, Caraphone, went to the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi to ask if any man was wiser than Socrates. She responded, that indeed, there was no man wiser. However, according to Xenophon, the oracle didn't actually use the word wiser, but said that there was no man more free, more just, or more sound of mind. In fact, throughout his entire description of Socrates, Xenophon avoided directly attributing wisdom of any kind to him, as this was a term that was often applied to the natural philosophers and sophists, and he tried to set his teacher apart from them. Regardless of semantics, though, the oracle's response in Xenophon, when it was relayed to him by Chirophon, comes as no surprise to Socrates, as it simply confirms what he knew all along, that he was the most virtuous man walking the earth. But in Plato's version, the response really got under Socrates' skin, as he had grown convinced that he knew nothing, and therefore that he possessed no wisdom whatsoever. So he decided to test the oracle's response by seeking out and questioning the wisest people in all of Athens, the so-called experts. Since Socrates professed to be ignorant and claimed to lack knowledge of anything fine and good, he wished to converse with those who were reputedly wise and could impart that wisdom to him. After annoying many of the political leaders, poets, playwrights, artisans, and so forth, one by one, he got them to contradict their own arguments. And ultimately, he concluded that nobody really knew anything. And since he knew that he knew nothing, and he knew this fact when others clearly did not, then he must know more than anyone, even the so-called experts. Therefore, the oracle was right after all, because he alone was aware of his own ignorance. On the other hand, instead of claiming ignorance, Xenophon Socrates, who knew himself as the most virtuous man walking the earth, feels free to dispense advice on a wide range of topics. Often, Xenophon puts rather banal ethical advice into his mouth. While there are differences between Plato's and Xenophon's depictions of Socrates, from a humble man who claims to know nothing, to one swaggering with confidence in his own perfection, both present a man who cared nothing for class distinctions or proper behavior. Instead of gathering at the traditional place, with the traditional people, speaking about the traditional topics, he went to the Agora and conversed with everyone including slaves, freemen, wealthy politicians, artisans, the poor, women, and so forth. Anyone was a source of wisdom for him, 
But instead of engaging in the didactic method, which comes from didaskane, meaning to teach, since one side of the conversation teaches the other, he believed that the best way to develop ideas was in the give and take of a conversation. Through these means, he engaged in dialectike, or dialectic, which comes from the Greek word dialogos, meaning dialogue or conversation. Therefore, a dialectic is a dialogue between two or more people holding different points of view about a subject, but wishing to establish the truth through reasoned arguments. Dialectic thus resembles a debate, but it excludes subjective elements such as emotional appeal and pejorative rhetoric. It can be contrasted with the aristic, which refers to arguments steadfast on each side that aim to successfully dispute another, rather than an objective search for the truth, or basically arguing for the sake of conflict, as opposed to resolving that conflict. In fact, the word comes from Eris, the goddess of chaos, strife, and discord. This was the type of question and answer teaching method that was popularized by the sophists. While engaging in the dialectic, Socrates distinguished himself with his unusual way of conversing with others, called the enlenkos, which roughly translates to cross-examine or refutation. We refer to it today as the Socratic method. With it, Socrates attempted to get the other person, known as the interlocutor, to understand the faults in their argument by responding to their statements through constant questioning. He would question anyone who claimed to have knowledge of any particular fact, so as to delve into the truth of the statements being made. For Socrates, an individual was an expert on a topic if he could adequately define it and teach that knowledge to others. And so, moral expertise comes from the possession of expert knowledge of moral virtues. He typically began one of these conversations by asking the interlocutor for a definition of an abstract quality, such as happiness or justice or the definition of a virtue, such as courage or temperance. His favorite responses started with, what do you mean, or what is so-and-so, to determine their underlying beliefs and the extent of their knowledge on the subjects that they just mentioned. When the interlocutor asserts a thesis that Socrates considers false and targets for refutation, he first would secure agreement to some further, typically uncontroversial premises. As Socrates lays out these premises, the interlocutor agrees, and then Socrates further questions to show the target's thesis is false due to their agreed-upon premises. For example, he might show that the definitions of courage and instances of courageous behavior stated by the interlocutor actually conflict with their other beliefs about the behavior that constituted courage. In this way, the Socratic method is a negative method of hypothesis elimination and that better hypotheses are found by steadily in identifying and eliminating those that lead to contradictions. It was designed to force one to examine one's own beliefs and the validity of such beliefs. Because of this, Socrates became famous for his ability to get people to contradict their own views and show through his questioning that they quite literally didn't know what they were talking about. Although Socrates insisted that he was not trying to undermine them, his unique method of searching for the truth often left his conversational partners in a state of puzzlement and irritation. In fact, as one of them put it, a conversation with Socrates made a man feel numb, just as if he had been stung by a stingray. At the same time, though, he had a keen wit and an engaging personality, and his deflation of people who were confident that they knew what words like good, right, and just meant endeared him to the youth in Athens, who loved to annoy their parents and elders themselves with this technique. In particular, he earned quite a lot of admirers from the sons of the nobility, and at symposia, he conversed, drank, and became a natural guru to many of them. As we discussed numerous times before, one of his favorite students was the popular and charismatic Alcibiades, someone who he had seen much promise in and had taken him under his wing in the hope that he could change his vain ways. Despite his ultimate failure there, the two had a particularly close relationship. Alcibiades even professed his love for him, but they kept their relationship strictly platonic. In addition, the youth of the non-elite also loved him because he worked for free, and so he acquired quite a large following, though he had nothing that could be called a school of learning more so an unofficial gathering of followers or disciples. His refusal to charge fees ultimately led him to become poor and earned him the ire of the for-profit people in education, that being the sophists, 
As we discussed in episode 87, the Sophists were the itinerant teachers of classical Greece. They taught a variety of subjects, but their most important focus was on rhetoric, which essentially was the art of persuasive speaking. A critical trait of Sophism was a skepticism of intellect, but this was also associated with a moral skepticism. Sophists believed that law was a compulsion, and that men were naturally selfish. Therefore, without a law forcing them to behave, they would see no natural reason to behave rationally whatsoever. The conclusion that they drew was that nothing was either right or wrong morally speaking, other than the fact that thinking it makes it so, referring to cultural relativity. It was this idea, through Socrates, that Plato sought so badly to challenge. His goal was to inculcate moral excellence, which he viewed as the particular excellence of a human being. As he puts it, the true aim of life was to make one's soul as good as possible. He believed that what people had to do, above all else, was to discover what true goodness was. This is where we see the deep differences between Socrates and the majority of the sophists. He was not satisfied with their emphasis on what was practical and useful at the expense of what he regarded as real morality. In addition, while the sophists made extravagant claims for their knowledge and their teaching, perhaps the most basic of Socrates' beliefs was that men were extremely ignorant and would never reach an understanding of virtue, truth, and so on without first realizing their ignorance. But like the sophists, Socrates used clever arguments and subjected conventional notions to rational analysis. As a result, both were jeered at by Athens' more conservative citizens, who naturally saw them as undermining their old social values and educational system. In particular, they disrupted the customary bond that placed education in the context of the family, making jealous those Athenian parents whose sons preferred his company to theirs and who gave his ideas greater credence. The fact that his methods of arguing were new, that he went around with a faithful band of followers, and that he was always engaged in irritating discussions made it easy for some to mistake Socrates as a sophist. And so, it's not surprising then that the shady reputation of the sophists would rub off on him. This would come to the forefront in Aristophanes' famous caricature of him. Produced at the city Dionysia in 423 BC, Aristophanes' comedic play, Nephili, or The Clouds, represents, or in this case misrepresents, Socrates as a typical sophist who is interested in celestial phenomena and who teaches the rhetorical skill of winning arguments by making the worse appear to be better. It was not as well received as the author had hoped, as it came in last of the three plays competing at the festival that year. But it was revised at some point between 420 and 417 BC and was thereafter circulated in manuscript form never to be reproduced in the author's lifetime. No copy of the original production survives, so we aren't sure what changes were made. In any case, the play in the form that we have it now begins in a courtyard where an older farmer named Strepsiades and his younger son, Phidippides, are attempting to sleep. Strepsiades suddenly sits up in bed, while Phidippides remains blissfully asleep in the bed next to him under a pile of blankets. The cranky older father complains to the audience that he is too worried about household debts to get any sleep. He has married well beyond his means, and his wife, the pampered product of an aristocratic clan, has encouraged their son's expensive interest in horses and chariot racing. But this affinity has unfortunately accumulated a large debt, which the father does not have the means to pay. In frustration, Strepsiades wakes up Phidippides and reveals to him that his creditors are threatening to seize their household goods. Hoping to convince his son of the seriousness of the situation, he adds that one day these huge debts will be his alone. And so, after thinking up a plan to get out of debt, Strepsiades pleads for his son to do something for him. Phidippides at first agrees to do as he's asked, but then he changes his mind when he learns that his father wants to enroll him in the Thinkery, a school for wastrels and bums that no self respecting, athletic young man would dare to be associated with. He says, quote, I know the villains. You mean those pale-faced, barefooted quacks, such as that wretched Socrates and Chirophon, end quote. When the son asks why he should go, Strepsiades explains that students of the thinkery learn how to turn inferior arguments into winning ones, and so he needs to go and learn this skill 
because this is the only way he could beat their aggrieved creditors in court. Strepsides pleads, quote, There are men there who can convince you that the heavens are a sort of fire extinguisher all around us, and we are like cinders, and they teach you, if you pay enough, to win your arguments, whether you're right or wrong, end quote. Pheidippides, though, will not be persuaded because he would never be able to face his friends again. And so, Strepsides decides to enroll himself, in spite of his advanced age. At the beginning of the next scene, Strepsides arrives at the Athenkery. After knocking on the door, he meets a student, who, although annoyed, tells him about some of the recent discoveries made by Socrates, the school's headmaster, including a new unit of measurement for ascertaining the distance jumped by a flea, a flea's foot, created from a minuscule imprint in wax, the exact cause of the buzzing noise made by a gnat, its rear end resembles a trumpet, and a new use for a large pair of compasses, as a kind of fish hook for stealing cloaks from pegs over the gymnasium wall. After entering the school, Strepsiades has shown several mathematical and scientific instruments, even a large map of Athens. Impressed, he begs to be introduced to the man behind these discoveries. The wish is soon granted, and Socrates appears overhead, wafting in a basket at the end of a rope, so that he can better observe and contemplate the sun and other meteorological phenomena. He would have been held aloft by a mechany, or crane, which was normally used in tragic plays for gods and heroes. When the old man swears by the gods that he will pay whatever Socrates charges, the philosopher immediately turns the discussion of religion and the importance of the clouds. Socrates sings, Come, glorious clouds, display your powers. Suddenly, the chorus of celestial clouds appears, and Socrates explains, quote, From them, we get our intelligence, our dialectic, our reason, our fantasy, and all of our argumentative talents. They give sustenance to a vast tribe of sophists, high-powered prophets, teachers of medicines, long-haired idlers with fancy signet rings, and especially the airy quacks who write those convoluted dithrams, end quote. According to Socrates, the clouds of the play's title are, quote, great goddesses of the empty-headed. They fill us with skill and logic, brain waves, sophistication, and the art of duping fools, garbling the truth, talking beside the point, spellbinding, meaningless oratory, and browbeating, end quote. Socrates then tells the skeptical Strepsiades that there is no Zeus. The clouds are the real divinities. The old man, still confused by this revelation, then promises to never make a sacrifice to a traditional god again, and claims that he is ready to learn to be the best order in Greece. But first, in order to test his intelligence, Socrates asks Strepsiades a number of questions. By the end, he learns that the old man does not have a good memory, nor is a natural speaker. However, he is a natural swindler, so Socrates agrees to take him on as a student. The philosopher then begins the induction ceremony for his new elderly student, the highlight of which is a parade of the clouds, the patron goddesses of thinkers and other layabouts. The clouds arrive, singing majestically of the regions from where they arose. Introduced to them as a new devotee, Strepsides begs them to make him the best order in Greece. They reply with the promise of a brilliant future. Then, Socrates leads him into another room for his first lesson, and the leader of the clouds steps forward to address the audience. Putting aside their cloud-like costumes, the chorus declares that this is the author's cleverest play, and that it cost him the greatest effort. He reproaches the audience for the play's failure at the end of the festival, where it was beaten by the works of inferior authors. And he praises the author, a.k.a. Aristophanes, for his originality and for his courage in lampooning influential politicians such as Cleon. The chorus then resumes its appearance as clouds, and Socrates returns to the stage in a huff, protesting against the ineptitude of his new elderly student. He exclaims, quote, In the name of respiration, chaos, air, and all that's holy, I've never met such a clueless, stupid, forgetful bumpkin in all my life. The most trifling little thing I teach him, he forgets before he has even learnt it. End quote. Socrates becomes more and more frustrated and summons Strepsiades outside and attempts further lessons. He tries to explain the differences between the names of objects, masculine and feminine, but he soon realizes it is hopeless. 
Then he tries a form of meditative incubation, in which the old man lies under a blanket, while thoughts are supposed to arise in his mind naturally. But the incubation results in Strepsiades masturbating under the blanket. And finally, Socrates refuses to have anything more to do with him. Desperate, Strepsiades turns to the leader of the clouds for advice, and is advised to send someone younger, like his son, to do the learning for him. And so, Strepsiades departs the thinkery back to his home. When he arrives, after a long talk with his son, including his own experiences at the thinkery, the father finally only manages to convince Pheidippides to go to the school by threatening him. Reluctantly, Pheidippides follows his father to the thinkery, but Socrates is not impressed by the younger son either. He finally gives in, though, and says he will accept the boy into the school. But luckily for Socrates, he says he will not be there, so he is to be taught by his associates, the personified arguments of right and wrong. They appear and debate with each other over which of them can offer the best education of the young man. Right, depicted as an old, distinguished-looking man, sides with justice, offering to prepare Phidippides for an earnest life of discipline, typical of men who respect the old ways. To counter this, wrong, portrayed as an unhealthy young man, denies the existence of justice, and offers to prepare him for a life of ease and pleasure, typical of men who know how to talk their way out of trouble. When Wright says that justice is to be found with the gods, Wrong asks why Zeus was not punished for putting his father in chains. Wrong then calls Wright an old windbag, so Wright responds by calling Wrong a young pansy and challenges his character. Quote, You're the one that encourages our adolescents to drop out of school. One day, Athens will wake up to what you've been doing to these young people who don't know any better. End quote. Wright adds that he hopes to be Phidippides' teacher so that the young man could lead a decent life and know how to do something besides talking. Both are finally asked by the leader of the clouds to explain their method of teaching, or old versus new education. Wright, during his defense of the old, says that in his day, children were seen and not heard, discipline was important, and one did not interrupt their father. But instead of defending the newer model of education, an anxious wrong decides to continue to bash right in the old ways. He turns to Phidippides and tells him that the virtuous cannot do a lot of things, and with them, a lot of pleasures are to be lost. No gambling, no women, and no fancy food. Therefore, is life worth living? The young man is convinced, and wrong wins. At the end of the debate, a quick survey of the audience reveals that buggers, people schooled by inferior arguments, have got into the most powerful positions in Athens. Right accepts his inevitable defeat, and wrong leads Phidippides into the thinkery for a life-changing education, as Strepsiades goes home happy. The cloud step forward to address the audience a second time, demanding to be awarded first place in the festival competition, in return for which they promise good rains. Otherwise, they'll destroy crops, smash roofs, and spoil weddings. The next scene begins with Strepsiades returning to the thinkery in order to fetch his son. As a new Phidippides emerges, he is shown transformed into the pale nerd and intellectual man, which he had once feared that he would be ridiculed by his friends for becoming. But Strepsiades rejoices in the prospect of his son talking their way out of financial trouble and leads the youth home for a celebration, just moments before the first of their aggrieved creditors arrives with a witness summoning him to court. And so Strepsiades comes back on stage and confronts the creditor, and with his jumbled logic, the confused creditor leaves, but a second one soon arrives. The old father charges him with suffering from some form of concussion of the brain. After a series of nonsensical questions, the second creditor also leaves. Strepsides then returns indoors to continue the celebrations. After the chorus of clouds sings ominously of a looming debacle, Strepsides again comes back on stage, now in distress, complaining of a beating that his new son has just given him in a dispute over the celebrations. Phidippides emerges coolly, and the clouds question how the altercation began. Strepsides says he asked his son to recite Aeschylus, the prince of the poets, but the son instead recited Euripides. The father then called his son a name, so the son hit him. The son explains, quote, I'm intimate with all the newest and subtlest ideas and principles, and I'm confident I can demonstrate that it is right and proper to chastise one's father, end quote. He then insolently debates his father, 
When Pheidippides asks him if he had beaten him as a child, the father says he did, but only because he cared. And so the son latches onto this and concludes that a beating equals caring, and adds that it must then even be proper to beat one's mother. After Pheidippides goes on to deny the existence of Zeus in favor of the clouds, the frustrated old father prays to the gods to have pity on his son for his ignorance, and then flies into a rage against the thinkery, as he puts full blame on Socrates for his latest problems with the son. His slave Xanthius fetches him a torch, and he leads the rest of his slaves in a frenzied attack on the disreputable school. When they arrive at the thinkery, they climb to its roof and set it on fire. Socrates and his alarmed students escape, but are pursued off the stage by Strepsiades and his slaves. As the play ends, the chorus of clouds, with nothing to celebrate, quietly departs. With a troubled father being pitted against a younger son, it's clear that Aristophanes' main theme in his play The Clouds is the clash between the old and traditional, with the new and innovative. The conservative anti-war author wrote against a change in Athens and chose the philosopher Socrates as a symbol of this change. To him, Socrates represented all that he disliked about a new Athens. The traditionalist author treasured the simplicity and morality of a bygone era. But in reality, the aura of Socrates spoke to the youth of the city by having them challenge and question both old customs and the government. At the thinkery, a fictionalized school run by the esteemed philosopher, Aristophanes has Socrates run a logic factory for the extra clever, in which right represents the old discipline, morality, and respect, while wrong voices the aims of the new education and the enjoyment of life. In all, both the sophists and Socrates were criticized for instilling the younger generation with a morally nihilistic, disrespectful attitude towards their society. Other comic poets whose works are lost, but are known to have lampooned Socrates at various points, included Menesimachus and Amypsius. Both Aristophanes and Plato portray Socrates as a disciplined, introverted thinker who practices asceticism and engages in a conversational dialectic. But the Socrates in Aristophanes is shown as a sophist, who is much more interested in physical speculations and natural sciences than in Plato. And it is possible that the real Socrates did take a strong interest in the natural world in his early years as a philosopher. But later in Plato's dialogues, as we mentioned, he preferred to discuss interesting philosophical questions that focused on the best way for humans to think and to live. And so, it has been argued that Aristophanes caricatured a pre-Socratic Socrates, and that the philosopher depicted by Plato was a more mature thinker who had been influenced by such criticism. Conversely, it is possible that Aristophanes' caricature of the philosopher merely reflects his own ignorance of philosophy. Whatever the case, it is still up for debate to what extent Aristophanes' play had in shaping public attitude towards Socrates, though Plato appears to have considered it a contributing factor in his negative reputation. Although this is unlikely, because Aristophanes' plays generally were unsuccessful in swaying the majority of people, it's still telling that the comic playwright chose to select Socrates to stand in for the whole movement of sophists and philosophers in the late 5th century BC Athens. For him, and likely for many others, Socrates was just one more intellectual who peddled the same goods as all the others. Despite the play, it says as much about Socrates' character that he and Aristophanes apparently remained on friendly terms. The play was presumably too ridiculously exaggerated to be taken personally, but it reveals, behind the laughter, the opinion that some held of the sophists, and by extension, of Socrates. It is said that Socrates stood up from his seat during the play so that the rest of the audience could see for themselves whether he really was as extraordinary as Aristophanes made him seem. Compared to the most successful sophists, Socrates lived in relative poverty and publicly disdained material possessions, though he did manage to have enough money to serve as a hoplite in the army and to support a wife and several children. He may have inherited some money, and he also received gifts from wealthy admirers, like Alcibiades. Nevertheless, Socrates did not consider material possessions to be particularly important, and because he paid so little attention to his physical appearance and clothes, many Athenians regarded him as eccentric. 
In fact, according to Xenophon, he sported a stomach somewhat too large to be convenient, and wore the same generic-looking cloak and scorned shoes, no matter how cold or hot the weather was that day. He became a well-known figure in the streets of Athens, always arguing and easily recognizable by a snub nose, shaggy eyebrows, bulging eyes, and rolling walk, which closely resembled that of a duck. His physical stamina was legendary, though, both from his tirelessness when he served as a soldier in the army, and from his ability to out-debate or out-drink anyone at a symposium. Socrates would spend almost his entire adult life within Athens' walls, other than a few brief periods of military campaigning, in which he fulfilled the role of a hoplite in the battles of Potidaea, Delion, and Amphipolis. As we have mentioned, Socrates was said to have saved Alcibiades' life at Potidaea, and Alcibiades returned the favor by doing the same for Socrates at Delion. Socrates would have been in his mid-fifties during the Sicilian expedition, and he was one of the few who spoke out openly against it, by indicating plainly that the expedition would be ruinous for the city. Also, at some point in the decade of the 410s BC, Socrates married an upper-class woman named Xanthippe, who was much younger than him, perhaps by as much as 40 years. Her aristocratic name, which literally means chestnut horse, is the feminine form of Xanthippos, the father of Pericles, which may suggest that she was an Alcmeonidae. She is especially remembered for having a fiery temperament, and Xenophon, in his symposium, has Socrates agree that, out of all of the women that he has encountered, she is the hardest to get along with. Nevertheless, he adds that he chose her precisely because of her argumentative nature. Perhaps punning on her name, Socrates is said to have joked, quote, Any horse I chose to own must show some spirit. End quote. In one anecdote, Xanthippe was once so enraged with her husband that she took a chamber pot filled with urine and poured it over his head, to which Socrates quipped, After thunder comes the rain. She bore him three sons, Lamprocles, Sophroniscus, and Menexenus. But according to Xenophon, these boys were incredibly dull and nothing like their father. Socrates wasn't interested in conventional politics, and he often stated that he could not look into others' matters or tell people how to live their lives when he did not yet understand how to live his own. He believed that he was a philosopher engaged in the pursuit of truth, but he knew that most of his followers had ambitious political goals themselves, and he also knew how to play on their ambitions. In one scene in his memorabilia, Xenophon shows us how Socrates used the desire of a young man for honor and political success by showing him that knowledge is the only sure route to these ends. By using success for a political leader as bait, Socrates was able to get his young friend to pursue virtue. For Socrates, to do anything virtuously meant to do it well, and to act well meant to do it with knowledge. At one point, Socrates is recorded as saying that the choice of an ignorant man as the political leader of a city would be like choosing an ignorant man to be one's doctor. Since we don't let untrained men experiment on our bodies, neither should we allow them to lead our government. However, it is very unlikely that Socrates actually believed in the idea of a philosopher king that is expressed in Plato's Republic. Still, Socrates was very much troubled by the notion of amateur government, in which anyone's opinion counted for as much as the next man's, and in which a volatile assembly was swayed this way and that by rhetorical displays. He believed that the average person wasn't intelligent or thoughtful enough to govern because genuine knowledge is possessed by only a few, so he constantly asked why should most people, that is the majority, make the life and death decisions that affect the polis. His insistence on asking this question need not be taken as an implication that he wanted decisions made by a minority, though. It is also hard to say whether he opposed the democracy and would have liked to see a different regime in instituted Athens, as it could be the case that had he lived under a monarchy or an oligarchy, those would have been the governments that he spent his time undermining. Socrates held only public office once in his life, and by chance, he served as the epistates of the Ecclesia on the day of the trial for the generals at Arganusae in 406 BC. Alone among the Pratanes, Socrates held fast in his position that he would do nothing that was contrary to the law, and refused to put some illegal measure to a vote, as we discussed in episode 106. 
He did not have a role for either side in the oligarchic revolutions of the war's last years, but one of his former students, Critias, was chief among them as the de facto leader of the Thirty Tyrants. Since Critias had been his student, and since Socrates remained in the city through this entire period, the public later would come to associate him with the Thirty. During the period of democratic restoration from 403 to 399 BC, without an empire to manage, the Athenians had a lot of downtime on their hands. Also, decades of war followed by months of terror under the Thirty had taken a heavy toll, and there was no lack of people eager to assign blame for Athens' post-war problems. With this backdrop, many came to the conclusion that everything had been fine when they had a democracy, and it was under those who favored an oligarchy that they became weak. And so, these dissident Athenians chose to unleash their anger on Socrates, who oftentimes in the past had spoken sharply against democracy. Combined with his association with Alcibiades and Critias, two men who in different ways had harmed the Athenian democracy, his poignant remarks about its foibles seemed downright unpatriotic, and he was easily cast as a purveyor of dangerous ideas. Furthermore, some people had already grown angry with him because he haunted the public spaces of Athens, frustrating the careless in argument, and annoying many jealous parents whose young sons had lionized him. So all of this snowballed, and he effectively became a scapegoat for their perceived degradation of Athenian society, which they believed had caused them to lose the war. Eventually, three Athenians, Miletus, Lycon, and Anitus, stepped forward to lead the charge against Socrates. Plato says that these men did so collectively on behalf of the city's poets, scholars, rhetoricians, craftsmen, and politicians. Little is known of Miletus, but he represented the interests of the poets and is considered the chief prosecutor because he was the only one on record who spoke during the trial. On the other hand, we know a little bit more about Lycon, who represented the interests of the scholars and rhetoricians. He became a successful democratic politician after the fall of the oligarchy of the 400, and since Socrates was Critias' teacher, he apparently blamed him for the death of his son, who was murdered by the Thirty. Finally, we know the most about Anitus, who represented the interests of the craftsmen and politicians. He came from a widely successful family of tanners, whose new wealth allowed him to become a powerful, upper-class politician, much like Cleon had before him. Anitus served as a general in the Peloponnesian War, during which he lost Pylos to the Spartans and was charged with treason, though he had bribed the jury for an acquittal. He eventually got back into the public's good graces by playing a major role in the overthrow of the Thirty, as he served as Thrasybulus' right-hand man. It has also been suggested, based in part on interpretations of Plato's dialogue, Meno, that Anitus personally blamed Socrates for corrupting his own son. It seems that Anitus had been grooming his son for a life in politics, until the boy became interested in Socrates' teachings and abandoned his political pursuits. In addition, Xenophon tells us that in frequenting the Symposia with Socrates, Anitus' son became a drunkard. Ultimately, in 399 BC, Miletus, Lycon, and Anitus registered an official accusation against Socrates. However, the amnesty law prohibited them from prosecuting him for what they really wanted, which was teaching a way of life that created both Alcibiades and Critias, so they had to get creative in order to mask their personal and political motives. What they settled on dealt with a concept of individual behavior, known as Eusebia, which is often translated as piety, but more closely resembles duty or loyalty to a course. In refusing to conform to the social proprieties prescribed by Eusebia, Socrates angered many of the more important men in the city, who could rightfully accuse him of breaking the law by violating these customs. Meletus filled the formal charges and swore to his statement before the Archon Basileus the magistrate with mostly religious duties. He considered the evidence and determined that there was justification for an actionable case, and so Socrates was formally charged with two counts of asebia, or impiety, for not believing in the gods of the city and for introducing new gods, and one count of morally corrupting the Athenian youth. Impiety is often closely associated with sacrilege, though, like in this case, it is not necessarily a physical action. Essentially, Socrates was accused of undermining the official religion by not giving the proper respect for something considered sacred and for corrupting the minds of the Athenian youth with his teachings and methodology. 
Despite the fact that Athenian law did not specify precisely what offenses constituted impiety, it ranked as an extremely serious crime, because the gods were believed to punish the entire city-state if they allowed it to go unpunished. The Greek city-states had no constitutional principles separating church and state or protecting free speech. In fact, we've already seen how charges of impiety were used for political purposes against two of Pericles' closest associates, Anaxagoras and Aspasia, and against Alcibiades. Whatever the case, Socrates would have to stand for a trial by jury against these three charges. Plato's Euthyphro occurs weeks before Socrates' trial and begins in the Agora near the court of the Archon Basileus. There, Socrates had just attended the preliminary hearing for his trial, and he encounters a young man named Euthyphro, who explains that he has come to present charges of murder against his own father. According to Euthyphro, his father arrested one of his co-workers for killing a slave from the family estate on Naxos. If you remember, there was no official police force in ancient Athens, so it was up to private citizens to enact justice on behalf of themselves or the aggrieved. In any case, while Euthyphro's father waited to hear from the exegetes, or interpreters of the law, about how to proceed, he had thrown the tied-up man into a ditch without proper care and attention, and so he eventually died of exposure to the elements. After Socrates hears Euthyphro's story, he is astonished by his confidence in being able to prosecute his own father for the serious charge of manslaughter, despite the fact that Athenian law allows only relatives of the dead to file suit for murder. Since Euthyphro seems to be overconfident in his own critical judgment of religious and ethical matters, Socrates says that he must have a clear understanding of what is pious or holy and what is impious or unholy. Therefore, Socrates asks Euthyphro to offer him a definition of piety or holiness, ostensibly to provide him with a definitive meaning that he can use to defend himself with in his pending trial, as he himself is being accused of impiety. Essentially, he wants to know what true piety is, so that he can use it to argue that he isn't being impious. But first, Euthyphro says that what lies behind the charge of impiety presented against Socrates is his claim that he is subjected to a daemonion or divine sign, which warns him beforehand of taking various courses of action. This leads Euthyphro and Socrates briefly to discuss his well-known skepticism of the traditional accounts about the Greek gods. Above all, he has critical reservations about their cruelty and inconsistent behavior, such as the castration of the early sky god Oranos by his son Cronus, a story Socrates said is difficult to accept as the truth. After claiming to know and be able to tell more astonishing divine stories, Euthyphro spends little time and effort defending the conventional Greek view of the gods. Instead, he is finally led to the true task at hand, as Socrates forces him to confront his own ignorance by pressing Euthyphro to the main argument of their dialogue, the definition of piety. In doing so, he offers Socrates four definitions, but flaws are found with each. Euthyphro gives, as his first definition of piety, that which he is doing now, referring to his prosecution of his father, the wrongdoer, for manslaughter, while impiety is failing to prosecute him. But Socrates rejects Euthyphro's proposal because it is the wrong kind of answer. He did not ask for an example of things that are pious and impious, but rather he wants to know what form makes pious actions pious and impious ones impious. For Socrates, only a particular kind of definition is an adequate answer to a what is so and so question, and any such definition must accurately describe the nature or essence of the thing in question. And so, Euthyphro gives it another try. His second definition is that piety is what is pleasing to the gods, and impiety, then, is what displeases them. Socrates applauds this definition because it attempts to specify the essence of piety, but then criticizes it for being subjective, because even the gods disagree among themselves as to what is pleasing and displeasing to each. There are things that one god considers just, fine, or good, whereas others consider it unjust, foul, or bad. This means that a given action, disputed by the gods, could be both pious and impious at the same time. A logical impossibility. Euthyphro pushes back against Socrates' criticism by noting that not even the gods would disagree among themselves that someone who kills without justification should be punished. Yet Socrates argues that disputes would still arise over just how much justification actually existed. 
Hence, the same action could be pious and impious. Therefore, Euthyphro's second definition of piety fails to specify that one thing which is characteristic of all and only pious things. Euthyphro then gives his third definition of piety, or that which is loved by all of the gods, and impiety is what they all hate. In reply, Socrates possesses the question that would eventually become known in philosophy as the Euthyphro Dilemma, which asks, Is the pious loved by the gods because it is pious, or is it pious because it is loved by the gods? Euthyphro seems unsure as to what he means, and so Socrates uses an analogy to clarify his question. In doing so, he gets Euthyphro to agree that when he called a thing carried, it's simply because it is being carried by someone, and not because it possesses an inherent characteristic which could be called carried. That is, being carried is not an essential trait of the thing being carried, but a condition, a state that the object is currently in. He also uses the examples of something being led and being seen to illustrate his point. He then moves to what we call beloved. Is something beloved in and of itself, like something can be big or red, or does it become beloved when it is loved by someone? Clearly, the answer is again the latter. Something becomes beloved when it is loved. So then, Socrates continues that something beloved by the gods becomes so because it is loved by them, to which Euthyphro agrees. And Socrates moves to the conclusion that reveals his contradiction. What is beloved by the gods cannot be pious. Euthyphro seems to be taken back, so Socrates reminds him of the definitions he gave previously. He had said that something is loved by the gods because it is pious, which means that their love follows from something inherent in the pious, and yet they just agreed that what is beloved is put in that state as a result of being loved. So piety cannot belong to what is beloved by the gods, since according to Euthyphro, it does not acquire its characteristics by something, the act of being loved, but has them inherently from the start in contrast to the things that are beloved that are put in this state through the very act of being loved. Socrates does agree that the gods like action because it is pious, but argues that the unanimous approval of the gods is merely an attribute of piety, and that divine approval is not a defining characteristic of piety, does not define the essence of piety, does not define what is piety, or does not give an idea of piety. And so, since divine approval is not a universal definition of piety, Euthyphro's third attempt at a definition for piety is also flawed. By this point, Euthyphro is a bit annoyed. So for the second half of the dialogue, Socrates opts to suggest his own definition of piety, which is that piety is a species of the genus justice. But he leads up to that definition with observations and questions about the difference between species and genus, starting with the question, Are you not compelled to think that all that is pious is just? Yet Socrates later says that the information provided in his question at Euthyphro is insufficient in itself for a clear definition of piety, because piety belongs to those actions we call just, that is morally good. However, there are actions, other than pious actions, which we call just, such as bravery and concern for others. Socrates asks, what is it that makes piety different from other actions that we call just? We cannot say something is true because we believe it to be true. We must find proof. In response, Euthyphro offers his fourth definition that piety is that which is concerned with looking after the gods. But Socrates objects, saying that looking after, if fused in its ordinary sense, with which Euthyphro agrees, would imply that when one performs an act of piety, one thus makes one of the gods better. An example of hubris a dangerous human emotion frowned upon by the Greek gods. In turn, Euthyphro responds that looking after involves services to others, and Socrates asks, what is the end product of piety? Euthyphro replies with his earlier third definition, that piety is what is loved by all the gods. Euthyphro then proposes a fifth definition, that piety is an art of sacrifice and prayer. He proposes the notion of piety as a form of knowledge, of how to do an exchange, quote, giving gifts to the gods and asking favors in return, end quote. Socrates presses Euthyphro to say what benefits the gods perceive from human gifts, warning him that knowledge of exchange is a species of commerce, 
Euthyphro objects that the gifts are not a quid pro quo between man and deity, but are gifts of honor, esteem, and favor. In other words, Euthyphro admits that piety is intimately bound to the likes of the gods. At the dialogue's conclusion, Euthyphro is compelled to admit that each of his definitions has failed. But rather than correct his faulty logic, he declines to discuss the matter any further and storms off in frustration. And so, Socrates concludes that since he was unable to define piety, he gave him nothing helpful for his defense against a formal charge of impiety. Three weeks after the purported discussion in Plato's Euthyphro was when Socrates' trial by jury was said to have taken place. As we discussed in episode 44, Athenian juries were male citizens over 30 years old and drawn by lot from an annual pool of hundreds of volunteers. Although neither Plato nor Xenophon identifies the number of jurors, a jury of 500 men was the legal norm at this time, so this number is likely. By Athenian custom, Socrates' trial would have taken only one day. In terms of structure, Meletus and the other two accusers each would have stood in the law court themselves to deliver previously crafted speeches to the jury. Although the speeches given by the three prosecutors on that day have not survived, the sophist Polycrates, sometime in the 390s BC, wrote a work titled The Indictment of Socrates, which presented a later crafted version of the prosecution speech by Anitus, but unfortunately, it too has been lost. Even so, from the Socratic dialogues, we know that they condemned Socrates for his political and religious activities in Athens. They testified how Socrates had ruined their children from hardworking teenagers to lazy adults who spent all their time thinking, and how he refused to acknowledge the sun and the moon as true gods and instead believed in false gods that corrupted the city. When the three prosecutors each finished their speeches, it was then Socrates' turn to speak. Two copies of his defense exist, called the apologia, or apology. It should be noted that the Greek word here does not connote apologizing in the modern sense, but rather means a refutation or a defense. Both are second-hand accounts by Plato and Xenophon, and the words they wrote down are almost assuredly not what was actually spoken. In fact, Xenophon was not even in Athens, as he was off soldiering with the Greek mercenary army of the 10,000 of the Persian Empire. More on that next episode. According to tradition, the source for his work was Hermogenes, a close friend of Socrates, who did in fact attend the trial. On the other hand, because Plato likely was in the courtroom at the time, scholars tend to give more credence to his version. Though, as we mentioned earlier, Plato's representation of the historical Socrates is not without its faults either. Therefore, both should be viewed with caution. The two writers seem more concerned about answering questions that arose after the trial than about the actual charges themselves, particularly in addressing why Socrates failed to get an acquittal. Xenophon asserts that Socrates dealt with his prosecution in an exceedingly arrogant manner, or at least was perceived to have spoken arrogantly, and he frames Socrates' defense not as a failure to effectively argue his side, but because he ultimately strived for the outcome of death. Conversely, while not omitting it completely, Plato worked to temper that arrogance, and so he portrays a Socrates who attempts to demonstrate a higher moral standard and to teach a lesson. This places Socrates in a higher moral position than his prosecutors in order to absolve him of his blame. Still, both portray a defiant man who has megalagoria, or a boastful manner of speaking, and who held disregard for the charges against him the feelings of the jury, and court protocol. He even refused the use of a speechwriter, which was standard in ancient Athens, as they had no professional lawyers. At the time, Lysias was among the most highly sought after and therefore highly paid, but as he admired Socrates deeply, he had offered his services free of charge. Socrates, though, refused his help, and instead chose to defend himself in court. In his opening remarks to the jury in Plato's Apology, Socrates sets the tone for his forthcoming defense by saying that he will not stoop to using sophistic language, meaning carefully arranged, ornate words and phrases, but will speak plainly in the manner he uses in the agora. He maintains that he simply speaks the truth, which is his normal manner of speaking. Quote, I am not an accomplished speaker at all, unless indeed they call an accomplished speaker the man who speaks the truth. End quote. He continues by stressing that only the truth should matter. Quote, My present request seems a just one, 
for you to pay no attention to my manner of speech, be it better or worse, but to concentrate your attention on whether what I say is just or not. For the excellence of the judge lies in this, as that of a speaker lies in telling the truth. End quote. Here, Socrates is arguing that he is no sophist, whose goals were not truth, but mere persuasion. With that caveat in place, Socrates then begins to respond to the official charges of corrupting the youth and of impiety against the pantheon of Athens by introducing new gods. He says to the court that these old accusations arise from years of gossip and prejudice against him, and so his fellow citizens' minds had been poisoned by his enemies when they were young and impressionable. He also says that the accusations for such things have already been publicly spoken about and published by the comic poet Aristophanes, referring to his aforementioned play The Clouds some 24 years earlier, and therefore fall well beyond the legal scope of a trial for impiety and corruption. Even still, he says that he will address them, and then he reformulates the charges into the language of previous accusations. He says that he is being blamed for committing injustices because he inquires into things below the earth and in the sky, meaning the gods, makes the weaker argument the stronger, and corrupts others by teaching them to follow his example. Addressing these accusations, he denies that he knows anything about things in the sky and below the earth, and claims not to teach anyone anything, let alone about such things, because he knows nothing. He explains such accusations by saying, Quote, what has caused my reputation it is none other than a certain kind of wisdom. What kind of wisdom? Human wisdom, perhaps. It may be that I really possess this, while those whom I mentioned just now, referring to his accusers, are wise with a wisdom higher than human, or else I cannot explain it, for I certainly do not possess it, and whoever says that I do is lying and speaks to slander me. End quote. He reiterates again that he cannot be mistaken for a sophist, because they are wise men, are thought to be wise by the people of Athens, and are highly paid and sought after for their teachings, whereas he lives in poverty and knows nothing. Socrates then says that these accusations against him began at the time of his obedience to the oracle at Delphi. He goes on to explain to the jury the Delphic oracle's puzzling pronouncement, which we discussed earlier, that there is no one wiser than he. Socrates says that he interpreted it as a riddle because, on the one hand, it is against the nature of the gods to lie, but on the other, he also knew that he possessed no wisdom. So trying to make sense of this, he says, quote, For a long time, I was perplexed about what she meant. So I proceeded to examine it in the following way. I approached one of the people thought to be wise, assuming that in his company, if anywhere, I could refute the pronouncement and say to the oracle, Here is someone wiser than I, end quote. But while investigating the meaning of the oracle's pronouncement by questioning those who he thought were wise, which included politicians, poets, scholars, and craftsmen, Socrates thought that their arguments were lacking, and when he said this to them, they would grow angry and restate stock accusations typically hurled against him by calling him a morally abominable man who corrupts the Athenian youth with sophistry and atheism. Socrates then bellows, quote, For those who are examined, instead of being angry with themselves, are angry with me, end quote. Socrates seems to have been unique in that only he, as the gadfly, was able to get these individuals to critically examine their beliefs. In doing so, he discovered that they were ignorant of what they professed to know, and worse yet, that they were ignorant of their own ignorance. He asked himself if he would rather be an imposter, like the wise people he interrogated, or if he would rather be himself. The answer was easy. And Socrates tells the jury that he would rather be himself than be anyone else. He says that in being himself, and in searching for a man wiser than himself, that is how he earned a bad reputation among Athens as politically powerful. At the same time, Socrates then explained that, because the young rich men of Athens, many of which were the children of people who he had questioned, had little to do at their time, they follow him about the city and observe his questioning of intellectual arguments and dialogue with other intellectual men. In turn, it's only natural that the young men imitate his method of learning. Having addressed the social prejudices against him that led to these types of accusations, Socrates then turns his attention to the official charges. Per Athenian legal convention, the defendant was allowed to cross-examine his accusers. Presumably, he questioned all three, 
But within Plato's Apology, we do have an account of Socrates' cross-examination of Melitos. Although Melitos claims that Socrates corrupts the Athenian young and is the only one to do so, he cannot provide a motive for why Socrates would do such a thing. In responding to the formal charges, Socrates flipped the script, quote, Melitos says that I am guilty of corrupting the young, but I say that Melitos is guilty of dealing frivolously with serious matters, of irresponsibly bringing people to court, and of professing to be seriously concerned with things about none of which he has ever cared, and I shall try to prove that this is so, end quote. Essentially, Socrates took the position that the best defense was a strong offense, and using his characteristic question and answer method for which he was famous, and which had apparently gotten him into trouble, he demolished Melitus by making him seem like an inarticulate fool who misunderstood the people and things about which he professed to care. While interrogating him, he sets forth two lines of arguments to demonstrate the inconsistency in Melitus' allegations. In the first, he begins with the premise that Melitus put forth that the citizens of Athens benefit the youth, but that Socrates alone corrupts them. He then gives an example proving the opposite. He says that in the case of horses, most people corrupt them, but only a few, the horse trainers, benefit them. Likewise, in the case of the youth, most people corrupt them, while only a few, the moral experts, benefit them. And so, it is not the case that the citizens of Athens benefit the youth, while Socrates alone corrupts them. Socrates then puts forward a second defense against the corruption charge. He begins with another premise that Melitos put forth that Socrates intentionally corrupts the youth and then gives an example proving the opposite. He says that wicked people harm their associates, while good people benefit them. So anyone who corrupts his associates runs the risk of being harmed by his associates too. No one then would prefer to be harmed rather than benefited by his associates. And so no one who understands that by corrupting one's associates, risks being harmed by them too, would intentionally corrupt them. Since Socrates knows that, by corrupting the youths of Athens, and that by associating with him, he risks being harmed by them, therefore he does not intentionally corrupt them. Essentially, Socrates argues that if he were to have corrupted anyone, it must have been in ignorance, and therefore he is not guilty because no good man would intentionally make bad those living around him, or risk making himself bad as well. Finally, Socrates puts forward a defense against the charge of asebia, or impiety against the gods. Melitus initially says that Socrates does not believe that there are any gods at all, meaning atheism. But in his cross-examination, Socrates gets him to contradict himself by saying that Socrates also believes in strange spirits. In addition, in support of the moral mission assigned to him by the Oracle at Delphi, Socrates acknowledges that he believes his conscience is something divine, and that he openly converses with an averting inner voice, which he calls his daemonion, or divine power. It doesn't show him the future necessarily, but it sort of regulates his behavior by speaking to him when he is about to make a mistake. In another of Plato's dialogues, titled Phaedrus, Socrates says that he considers this a form of divine madness. Although we would probably call this our intuition, Socrates characterizes this phenomenon as divine, mysterious, and independent of his own thoughts. Socrates then says that everyone who believes there are human activities must believe that there are humans, or musical activities that there are musicians, and so forth. Likewise, everyone who believes in divine activities, like his daemonion, must believe that there are divinities. In addition, he says that these spirits must be either gods or the offspring of gods, and since no one believes in flutes playing without flute players, or in horses' offspring without horses, Socrates could not believe in the offspring of gods without believing in the gods themselves. Therefore, Socrates must believe that there are gods. Socrates next addresses the topic of death, proclaiming in court, quote, To fear death, my friends, is only to think ourselves wise without really being wise, for it is to think that we know what we do not know. For no one knows whether death may not be the greatest good that can happen to a man, but men fear it as if they knew quite well that it was the greatest of evils. End quote. Essentially, Socrates is saying that his wisdom is in being aware that he is ignorant on this, as well as other topics. He then defiantly states that he will continue to philosophize over conforming to society's expectations, no matter the costs, because he must choose service to the divine who has appointed him on this mission. 
In regard to a citizen's obedience to authority, Socrates says that a lawful authority, either human or divine, should always be obeyed. But in a conflict of obedience to such authorities, he thinks that obeying divine authority supersedes obeying human authority. Quote, Gentlemen, I am your grateful and devoted servant, but I owe a greater obedience to the Delphic God than to you. And as long as I draw breath and have my faculties, I shall never stop practicing philosophy. End quote. Basically, Socrates believed that the oracle was giving him a sort of divine mission to examine people relentlessly with the goal of demonstrating their own ignorance and encouraging them to pursue the virtuous life by spurring them to greater awareness of ethics and moral conduct. He says that, even without him, they must continue the search because the unexamined life is not worth living. But if they went on looking, in the end, they might discover what true goodness is, and when they know it, they could put it into practice, because virtue is knowledge. Socrates then concludes this part of the speech by asking his fellow citizens on the jury, quote, Are you not ashamed for caring a great deal about money, status, and reputation, and for trying to get as much of these as you can, while you neglect wisdom and truth and are not concerned about improving your souls? End quote. Granting no concession to his precarious legal situation, Socrates then speaks even more provocatively to the court. He explains in poignant detail the great service that he has provided to the state with his relentless probing by saying that the greatest good which has ever occurred to them is his moral concern for them as fellow citizens. He argues that if they kill him, a better man would be killed by worse ones, and that Athens is nothing without him, as he is the gadfly who arouses the stubborn horse. It should be pointed out, though, that in the Greek text, when describing himself, Socrates never actually uses the term for gadfly or oistrous. Rather, his reference is merely elusive, as he literally says that he has attached himself to the city in order to sting it. Nevertheless, he does make the bold claim that he is the god's gift to the Athenians. As such, he is a benefactor to them all because at his own expense, he has kept them awake and aware. He says, quote, All day long, I will never cease to settle here, there and everywhere, rousing, persuading, and reproving every one of you, end quote. In doing so, Socrates says that since he never was a paid teacher, he is not responsible for the corruption of any Athenian citizen. Then he asks, quote, If I corrupted anyone, why have they not come forward to bear witness? If the corrupted Athenians are ignorant of having been corrupted, then why have their families not spoken on their behalf? End quote. In a matter-of-fact tone, Socrates then points out relatives of the Athenian youth who he has supposedly corrupted and who are present in court to give him their support. Socrates finishes by bucking another Athenian norm and refusing to conform to the expected behavior of a defendant on trial for a capital crime. Typically, a speechwriter would present the defendant as a good man who had been wronged by a false accusation, and oftentimes, there would be weeping, pleading, and parading of his children in front of the jury. But Socrates concludes his legal defense by reminding the judges that he shall not resort to emotive tricks and arguments, that he shall not cry in public, and that his three sons will not appear in court to pathetically sway the judges. Socrates says that he relies solely upon sound argument and truth to present his case at trial. Surprisingly, despite his tone, the likely 501 citizens who made up the jury were split on what to do. According to Plato, he lost his case by about 30 votes, so the outcome theoretically was something like 266 to 235. With his conviction, the standard Athenian legal procedure then required the jury to vote on a punishment. The prosecution, in this case, had proposed that they were seeking the death penalty. Under Athenian law, if one is found guilty of a crime and awaiting a death sentence, he was required to propose an alternative sentence instead. Nonetheless, it seems that Socrates' accusers had expected him to propose exile, and they would have been quite content to see him leave town rather than be executed. This was typical for most defendants to propose instead of death, and most times, the jury would accept this alternative penalty. And so, Socrates' supporters even tried to persuade him that exile would be best. But instead, true to his gadfly nature, he provoked the jury even further by suggesting that instead of punishing him based on his services to the city, they should reward him with an annual stipend and free meals for life in the Pretanion, the city's sacred hearth, and the location of the public dining hall for the city magistrates. This was an honor typically given to Olympic victors and benefactors of Athens, so he was proposing that the people should treat him as such. <laughs> 
After the court dismissed his proposed reward, in Plato's account, Socrates then offered to pay a fine of one-fifth of his property, or a hundred drachmae, which testifies to his integrity and poverty as philosopher. However, Xenophon's version says that he refused to suggest any alternative penalties and refused to allow his friends to do so, claiming that to do otherwise would imply guilt. According to Diogenes Laertes, several of Socrates' supporters, including Plato, Crito, Critobulus, and Apollodorus, had proposed a fine of 3,000 drachmae and guaranteed its payment. Nonetheless, since accused criminals on trial for their life were expected to beg for the mercy of the court, not that they should be rewarded, this was seen as a serious insult to the honor of many Athenians. He offended a number of those who initially wanted him acquitted, and so even more voted that a fine was insufficient. According to Diogenes Laertes, around 280 jurors voted for the death penalty, and around 220 voted for a monetary fine. Therefore, the original punishment of death remained. According to Xenophon, though, Socrates preferred the outcome of death because he wished to end his satisfying life now, before the sad realities and limitations of old age overtook him. In fact, Xenophon suggests that Socrates was already sick when he went on trial, and that he welcomed death as a release from his pain, which would explain why he put up such an antagonizing defense. Essentially, Socrates preferred to die before the onset of senility rather than to escape death by humbling himself to an unjust persecution. Some scholars disagree and believe that he was making a stand as a martyr against Athenian democracy. It is also possible that Socrates was testing the jury to see if they understood who he really was and what he really provided to Athens. Whatever the case, Plato does not mention any of this and instead makes it clear that Socrates' willingness to face the death penalty was due to his unwavering commitment to continue philosophizing at all costs. In fact, he has Socrates respond to the death penalty verdict by confronting the jurors who voted for his death. He tells them that instead of waiting a short time for him to die from old age, they now have chosen for him to die unjustly, and thus must accept the consequences in the form of harsh criticisms from his supporters. He also prophesied that his death would cause the youngsters to come forward and replace him as a social gadfly, and that they would be more vexing than he. But to the jurors who voted to acquit him, Socrates gives encouragement that they made the right choice. He says that his supernatural daimonion did not interfere with his conduct of the legal defense, which he viewed as a sign that such a defense must have been the correct action. In that way, the daimonion communicated to Socrates that death must be a good thing. Either death will be his annihilation, a release from earthly worries, and thus not to be feared, or death will be his migration to a higher plane of existence where the souls of heroes and famous people reside. Socrates' final words to the court are that he bears no ill will, neither towards his accusers, Miletus, Lycon, and Anitus, nor the jurors, and then asks the Athenians to correct them if his three sons value material wealth more than living virtuously, or if they become too prideful. And in doing that, justice would finally be served. One of Socrates' friends, a wealthy man named Crito, tried to vouch for Socrates, but bail was denied, and he was sent off to prison. We are unsure of the exact location of his cell, but according to excavations, it is believed to have been about 100 meters southwest of the Helia court, just outside the Athenian Agora. There he waited for four weeks until his death sentence would be administered, instead of being executed immediately, which was standard procedure at Athens. That's because the Athenians had sent a sacred delegation aboard the Delios on its annual spring voyage to the Cyclotic island of Delos for the festival of Apollo. While official religious activities were in progress, executions were not allowed to be carried out, and so his life was preserved for a little while longer while the strong winds of the Aegean held back the sacred ship's return. Socrates lived on in prison, passing his time by creating poetical versions of Aesop's fables, comforting his family, enjoying long talks with the jailer, and holding philosophical conversations with a few faithful disciples. According to Xenophon, some of Socrates' friends and supporters had made plans for his escape, and although he could have fled Athens if he had wished, instead he declined. His reasoning, which is the subject of Plato's Crito, is an ancient version of the social contract theory of government which emerged as the leading doctrine of political legitimacy during the Age of Enlightenment, and usually concerns the legitimacy and authority of the state over the individual. The dialogue begins in the early hours of the morning, the day before his execution date. 
Crito arrives at Socrates' cell, and he bribes the guard for entry. Once inside, he sits beside Socrates until he wakes. A half-awoken Socrates makes light of Crito's earliness, to which Crito expresses concern about how relaxed he seems to be about his upcoming execution. To this, Socrates responds that he is almost 70 years old, and that to be scared of death now would be inappropriate. Crito then says that the reason he has come to see Socrates is because he has learned that the execution will take place on the next day, and he wishes to rescue him by bribing all of the guards. He assures Socrates that if he feels bad enough about using his friend's money, that he himself has enough money to see the plan through. And even if that weren't true, he has additional friends that are just as willing to pay whatever it costs to save his life. He continues that after being rescued from prison, Socrates would be taken to a home in Thessaly, where Crito and his friends would be more than happy to house and feed them. Likely because Crito understands Socrates well enough to know that his friend would be a bit obstinate, he then gives a number of considerations for why he should escape. First, he claims that by not escaping and allowing himself to be executed, Socrates would be guilty of harming his friends by depriving them of his presence and by giving them a bad reputation in the eyes of many who would believe that they didn't bother trying to save him. In addition, he would be guilty of harming his family, particularly his sons, by abandoning them. And finally, himself, since he would be collaborating in an injustice, which is shameful. This sets up the central question of the dialogue. Would escaping be the just thing for Socrates to do? After hearing Crito's arguments, Socrates requests that he would be allowed to respond with a discussion of related, open-ended issues on daikosune, or justice, and adikia, or injustice. After Crito agrees, Socrates goes on with his arguments. He first comments that only the opinions of the educated should be taken into consideration, and the opinions of those with subjective biases or beliefs may be disregarded. Likewise, just because an opinion is popular doesn't give it validity. Socrates uses the analogy of an athlete listening to their physician instead of their fans, since the physician's knowledge makes their opinions informed. Socrates also claims that similar to how life is pointless for one who has injured themselves out of incompetence, damage to the soul in the form of injustice makes life worthless for a philosopher. Therefore, the goal for a philosopher should be to live a virtuous and just life, not the longest one possible. And so the discussion of his escape from prison will center around justice. Socrates then disregards Crito's fears of a damaged reputation and his children's futures as those are irrelevant to him. He compares such motivations to someone who sentences someone else to death, and then proceeds to regret the action. Socrates claims that Crito and his friends should know better, as they have shared the same principles for a long time, and to abandon them at their age would be childish. He then says, quote, So then consider very carefully whether we have this view in common, and whether you agree, and let this be the basis of our deliberation, that neither to do wrong nor to return a wrong is ever right, not even to injure in return for an injury received. When one has come to an agreement that it is just with someone, should one fulfill it or cheat on it? End quote. Essentially, Socrates lays out three principles. The principle of justice in which one ought never to willingly do wrong. The principle of non-retaliation in which one ought never to return wrong for wrong. And the principle of just agreements in which one ought always to fulfill and uphold just agreements. As Socrates then points out, the questions now are, by escaping, would he be harming Athens and its laws? Would wronging the state be an injustice, even if in reaction to an injustice? And would he not be fulfilling his just agreement and social contract with Athens and its laws? To solve these questions, Socrates creates a personification of the laws of Athens and speaks through their point of view which would be to defend the state and its decision against him. According to Socrates, the laws would argue that without respect for their rules, a state cannot exist. They would criticize Crito for believing that he and every other citizen had the right to brush off court judgments, as only chaos could ensue. In this hypothetical, Crito argues that he does not oppose the entire law, but only a wrong judgment, to which Socrates asks what right he has to critique his hometown, whose legal system he would undermine with this behavior. In response, Socrates is reminded and has to refute the basis of his existence, that the existence of the estate allowed his father to marry his mother, and thanks to this, he was born and educated. 
Like all Athenians, he owes all of the good things that his citizenship can give to a lawful order. Anyone who disapproved of the conditions and laws in Athens could emigrate with all of their possessions, but those who decide to remain automatically choose to follow the laws of the state. If they think something in the law is wrong, it is up to them to argue against it. If they fail, meaning they were unable to do so, they would have to respect the applicable law. This is essentially true for Socrates, as he spent his entire life in Athens and preferred it to anywhere else, even the states that he used to boast about. He also demonstrated his agreement with the Athenian living conditions by establishing a family in his hometown. In addition, he had rejected banishment as a possible alternative to execution and explicitly preferred death. If he had wanted to, he could have opted for exile during the trial and then left Athens legally. Furthermore, the laws claim that if he accepted the offer to flee, Socrates would expose his helpers to the loss of their assets, and as a fugitive in his new well-organized city-state, He would be seen suspiciously by its citizens, because he would be suspected of violating the laws there as well in the future. He would thus have to be content with a region like Thessaly, which was chaotic and disorganized. There he could entertain crowds with the story of his unjust escape. As a philosopher who has become unfaithful to his principles though, he would be so discredited that he would have to give up his previous life's content. Then his sense of life would only be in food. If he did not want to abandon his children, he would have to take them to Thessaly, where they would be homeless. On the other hand, if he left them in Athens, their good education would be guaranteed by Socrates' friends, but his survival would be of no use to them. In conclusion, if Socrates were to accept his execution, he would die wronged by men rather than the law, and therefore remain just. However, if he were to take Critos' advice and escape, he would wrong the laws and betray his life's pursuit of justice. After completing this imaginary plea of the laws, Socrates says he is chained to the laws as a dancer is to flute music, and requests that if Crito has any rebuttals, that he give them now. Crito has no objections, and before leaving, Socrates refers to the same divine guidance that he hopes to be helped by. Plato's fourth and last dialogue to detail Socrates' final days is the Phaedo. It is set in the last hour prior to his death, and his philosophical subject is the mortality of the soul. Although Plato himself was not there for the execution, the dialogue is told from the perspective of another one of his students, Phaedo of Elis, who was present at Socrates' deathbed. The opening scene is set in the city-state of Phleos, in the northeastern Peloponnese, where a Pythagorean philosopher named Echocrates comes upon Phaedo and asks for news about the last days of Socrates. Phaedo explains why a delay occurred between his trial and his death, describes the scene in the prison of Athens on his final day, and names those present. He tells how he had visited Socrates early in the morning with the others, including Cebes and Simeus, who were Theban philosophers in Socrates' inner circle. According to Phaedo, Socrates' wife Xanthippe is also there, but is very distressed, and so Socrates asks that she be taken away. Socrates relates how he, driven by a recurring dream to make and cultivate music, wrote a hymn, and then began writing poetry based on Aesop's fables. Socrates then says to Cebes and Simeus, quote, Bid me farewell, my friends. Say that I would have him come after me if he be a wise man. End quote. Simeus expresses confusion as to why they should hasten to follow Socrates to death. Socrates then states, quote, He who has the spirit of philosophy will be willing to die, but he will not take his own life. End quote. Kebes raises his doubts as to why suicide is prohibited. He asks, quote, Why do you say that a man ought not to take his own life, but that the philosopher will be ready to follow one who is dying? End quote. Socrates replies that although death is the ideal home of the soul, one should not commit suicide, except when it becomes necessary, because we possess no actual ownership of our bodies. They are the property of the gods, or as Socrates puts it, the gods are our guardians and we men are a chattel of theirs. Socrates continues that although suicide is prohibited, in a higher sense, the philosopher should still seek to rid himself of the body, and to focus solely on things concerning the soul, because the body is an impediment to the attainment of truth. Of the senses' failings, Socrates says to Simeus, quote, Did you ever reach the truths with any bodily sense? And I speak not of these alone, but of absolute greatness, and health, and strength, and in short, of the reality or true nature of everything. Is the truth of them ever perceived through the bodily organs? 
or rather, is not the nearest approach to the knowledge of their several natures made by him who so orders his intellectual vision as to have the most exact conception of the essence of each thing he considers. End quote. Socrates then argues that the philosopher, if he loves true wisdom and not the passions and appetites of the body, accepts that he can come closest to true knowledge and wisdom and death, as he is no longer confused by the body and the senses. In life, the rational and intelligence functions of the soul are restricted by bodily senses of pleasure, pain, sight, and sound, but death is a rite of purification from the infection of the body. And so, as the philosopher practices death his entire life, he should greet it amicably and not be discouraged upon its arrival, because since the universe that the gods created for us in life is essentially good, why would death be anything but a continuation of this goodness? Death is a place where people and wiser gods rule, and where the noblest souls exist. Quote, and therefore, so far as that is concerned, I not only do not grieve, but I have great hopes that there is something in store for the dead, something better for the good than for the wicked. End quote. For Socrates, the soul attains virtue when it is purified from the body. Quote, he who has got rid, as far as he can, of eyes and ears, and so to speak, of the whole body, these being, in his opinion, distracting elements when they associate with the soul, hinder him from acquiring truth and knowledge, who, if not he, is likely to attain to the knowledge of true being. End quote. Cabes concedes these points to Socrates, but he still voices his fear that when the soul leaves the body, it will go nowhere, but instead perish and come to an immediate end dispersing and vanishing away into nothingness. In order to alleviate Kebis' worry, Socrates introduces his first argument for the immortality of the soul, which is often called the cyclical argument. It supposes that the soul must be immortal since the living come from the dead. Socrates argues, quote, Now if it is true that the living comes from the dead, then our souls must exist in the other world. For if not, how could they have been born again? End quote. He then goes on to show, using examples of relationships, such as asleep, awake, and hot, cold, that things which have opposites come to be from their opposite. For example, one falls asleep after having been awake, and after having been asleep, he awakens. Things that are hot come from being cold, and vice versa. Ultimately, Socrates gets Kebes to conclude that the dead are generated from the living through death, and that the living is generated from the dead through birth the souls of the dead must exist in some place for them to be able to return to life. However, Kebes notices a flaw in Socrates' argument and interrupts him to point this out. Quote, Socrates, your favorite doctrine that our learning is simply recollection, if true, also necessarily implies a previous time in which we have learned what we now recollect. But this would be impossible unless our soul had been somewhere before existing in this form. Here, then, is another proof of the soul's immortality, end quote. And so Socrates' second argument, the theory of recollection, shows that it is possible to draw information out of a person who seems not to have any knowledge of a subject prior to his being questioned about it. This person must have gained this knowledge in a prior life and is now merely recalling it from memory. Since the person in Socrates' story is able to provide correct answers to his interrogator, it must be the case that his answers arose from recollections of knowledge gained during a previous life. In Socrates' third argument for the immortality of the soul, the so-called affinity argument, he shows that the soul most resembles that which is invisible and divine, and the body resembles that which is visible and mortal. From this, it is concluded that while the body may be seen to exist after death in the form of a corpse, as the body is mortal, the soul, which is divine, must outlast the body. And so, to be truly virtuous during life is the quality of a great man who will perpetually dwell as a soul in the underworld. However, those who were not virtuous during life, and so favored the body and pleasures, pertaining exclusively to it, their soul is, quote, polluted and impure at the time of its departure, and is the companion and servant of the body always, and is in love with and bewitched by the body and by the desires and pleasures of the body, until it is led to believe that the truth only exists in a bodily form, which a man may touch and see, and drink and eat, and use for the purposes of his lusts, end quote. Socrates then says that those of such a constitution will be punished while in Hades, 
their punishment will be of their own doing, as they will be unable to enjoy the singular existence of the soul in death because of their constant craving for the body. Finally, they will be dragged back into corporeal life and imprisoned in another body. Socrates concludes that, on the other hand, the soul of the virtuous man is immortal, and the course of its passing into the underworld is determined by the way he lived his life. The soul of the philosopher, and indeed any man similarly virtuous, in neither fearing death nor cherishing corporeal life as something idyllic, but by loving truth and wisdom, will be eternally unperturbed after the death of the body, and the afterlife will be full of goodness. Simeon seems unconvinced, but no longer wishes to disturb Socrates' belief in the immortality of the soul during his final hours. Socrates, though, assures him, and the rest of those present, that regardless of whether or not he has succeeded in proving the soul's immortality to them, it will not impact his own beliefs. For this reason, he is not upset over facing death, and assures them that they ought to freely express their concerns regarding his arguments. And so, Simeus continues and presents his case as to why the soul is not immortal. He argues that the soul resembles the harmony of the lyre, and so once the lyre has been destroyed, the harmony too vanishes. Therefore, when the body dies, the soul too vanishes. Before Socrates responds to this, he asks Kebes to voice his objection as well. Kebes says that he is not ready to infer that just because the body may exist after death, so too does the soul. He gives the example of a weaver. When the weaver's cloak wears out, he makes a new one. And when he dies, his more freshly woven cloaks continue to exist. Kebes continues that although the soul may outlast certain bodies and may continue to exist after certain deaths, it may eventually grow so weak and dissolve entirely at some point. Therefore, it may be that the next death is the one after which the soul ultimately collapses and exists no more. After hearing the arguments of his two friends, Socrates then proceeds to give his fourth and final proof for the immortality of the soul by showing that the soul is immortal in the cause of life. He begins by saying that if there is anything beautiful other than absolute beauty, it is beautiful only insofar as it partakes of absolute beauty. Consequently, as absolute beauty is a form, and so is life, then anything which has the property of being animated with life participates in the form of life. As an example, he uses the number three. He says, quote, Will the number three not endure annihilation or anything sooner than be converted into an even number while remaining three? End quote. Forms, then, will never become their opposite. As the soul is that which renders the body living, and that the opposite of life is death, it so follows that the soul will never become the opposite of what it always brings. That which does not admit death is said to be immortal. Socrates thus concludes, quote, Then Kebes, beyond question, the soul is immortal and imperishable, and our souls will truly exist in another world. Once dead, my soul will go to Hades and be in the company of departed men, better than those whom I leave behind. End quote. Basically, Socrates is arguing, and is comforted by the fact, that upon death, his soul will dwell amongst those who were true philosophers like himself. After relaying this philosophical discussion, Phaedo then tells about the final moments of the great philosopher's life. Socrates shortly thereafter drank the infamous hemlock, the preferred method of execution for the Athenians, as it affected the central nervous system, leading to muscular paralysis and a swift death. He died in his prison cell at about the age of 70, surrounded by many of his closest students and friends. As Plato puts it, quote, Such was the end of our friend, a man, I think, who was the wisest and most just, the best man I have ever known. End quote. Xenophon in his memorabilia summed up the feelings of his admirers. Quote, all those who knew what sort of person Socrates was, and who aimed at excellence in their lives, continue even now to long for him most of all because he was the most helpful of all in learning about excellence. End quote. Unsurprisingly, according to Diodorus, the Athenians came to regret their hasty decision, and consequently, they were angered at the accusers and ultimately put them to death without trial. The intellectual controversy that Socrates provoked in his life continued well after his death, as his influence was felt immediately in the actions of his disciples, who formed their own interpretations of his life and teachings, and who set about forming their own philosophical schools and writing about their experiences with their teacher. For example, Antisthenes founded Cynicism, Aristippus began the Cyrenaic school, Xenophon's writings would influence Zeno of Kition, who in turn founded Stoicism, and his most famous pupil, Plato, 
shortly after his teacher's death, began to write his dialogues in which Socrates served as a mouthpiece for his own thinking. In fact, every major philosophical school mentioned by ancient writers following Socrates' death was founded by one of his followers, and the diversity of thought espoused by these schools is testimony to Socrates' wide-ranging influence, and more importantly, to the diversity of interpretations of his teachings. It has been said that Socrates' greatest contribution to philosophy was to move intellectual pursuits away from the focus on physical science, as pursued by the so-called pre-Socratics, into the abstract realm of ethics and morality. No matter the diversity of the schools which claimed to carry on his teachings, they all emphasized some form of morality as their foundational tenet. But the fact that the morality espoused by one was often condemned by another again bears witness to the very different interpretation of Socrates' central message. Collectively, these works would become the foundation of Western philosophy. So in this way, the strains occasioned by the Peloponnesian War played a dramatic role in the history of ideas. In the next episode, we turn our attention to the life of one of Socrates' more famous pupils and the post-Peloponnesian War Pan-Hellenic campaign into the heart of the Persian Empire that he made famous through his writings. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 110, Xenophon and the Ten Thousand. 